What if a kidnapper kidnapped you and just observed you? Not even physically abused you, just observed you almost like a zoo. This is a wild case of an educated young man who ended up kidnapping a girl just to observe her from a distance. Who is now considered just weird and creepiest criminal that you'll probably ever hear. I'm still very confused to why he has done what he has done and you guys be the part judge today on trying to dissect this man. This story actually reminds me a little bit about a movie that I heard about where this man just put a bunch of people in his basement and just observed them just to see what they would do and just psychologically how it would affect them, how they would interact with other people inside that you know small basement that he had. I guess there's some kind of a creepy thing about observing something without in the typical mind oh they're gonna abuse them or do something bad to them. No, just just to see what they would do. It's like a weird corner that I've never really explored before so um, I am a little bit dressed up today because as I said in my entertainment Gory's and Grace account this was my birthday dress that I wore in the video my birthday did pass and as I get one year older you know I'm trying to take care of my health you know taking care of your health means doing it when you are youngest and that's why I personally learned that it is so important to take extra nutrients supplements vitamins and one of the ways that I get my vitamins and supplements is through care of. Care of is a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders right to your door every single month or whenever you need it. All I do is take the easy quiz to see what kind of vitamins and supplements that I need for my own body. I got the Shatavari for hormonal balance, got some American ginseng and B complex for energy support because I've been lacking some energy. And don't worry, these packagings are compostable made from plants. And one of my favorite things from Care of is the matcha collagen powder. You guys want to tell you, I make the best drink out of this. I make an iced matcha espresso latte with this. Only 15 calories per serving. So if you guys want to know what vitamins and supplements are right for you, take the care of quiz and get 50% off your first box using my code down below. And you guys know sponsors really help me to continue making these videos. So just by clicking the link and checking it out is really helping to support my channel. This case I learned from Diva Jessica's video. She's a very popular Korean true crimes reporter and I could not find any English true crime reporters at the, this video. This is Anna Saito, which is like Jane Doe name to protect the real name of the girl. She was 13 years old back in 2014. She was known to be a bright, beautiful girl. As you see in this photo, she's very pretty, kind, and listened to her parents well. She was just in middle school and she lived in the Asaka city. Her parents say she had many hobbies, including ballet. It was March 10th, 2014, when Anna usually returns from school around 4 to 5 p.m., but when her parents returned home, she was nowhere to be found, and they found this letter supposedly written by Anna inside of their post box. I want to take a break from school and home. Don't find me. Remember, this is a 13-year-old kid who has never run away from home, never really gave much trouble to their parents, all of a sudden writing you this letter. But nevertheless, it seems like the parents were first questioning themselves like, oh my god, what did I do to my child? Did we do something that triggered this 13-year-old to run away? Of course, the parents right away called their friends, school, anywhere she could be to find out where Anna could have gone. And when they didn't find her, they finally reported to the police that night. There was absolutely no information of where she could have been. So they made this poster with her information on it in hopes that anybody would see her. She was 155 centimeters, 40 kilograms, and it seems like she wore her school uniform just before she went missing. There was only one tip, which was a neighbor who claims to have seen Anna the day she went missing talking to a young man who looked like he was in his late teens, like 18, 19 to early 20s. But there was no other information and Anna literally just vanished into the thin air. But on the ninth day, they received a letter which seemed like it was written by Anna's handwriting. The letter stated, I'm doing fine. I'm sorry for causing a lot of stress. Don't find me. This letter had a stamp on it which seemed like it was from a town called Chiba that was less than 20 miles away from Anna's house. Again, the letter did not seem like it was genuinely Anna's words. 
Police try to look as best as they can in the Chiba town and again, they didn't find anything Nobody was seen anything. So they Partially thought that maybe Anna really did run away and maybe she was lured in by this older guy who promised her things You know turned her away from her parents, which is actually very common, especially in the internet age I mean definitely when I was younger, I was always upset at my parents. I mean who isn't it feels like no one could understand your world it's Definitely many times I was tempted to run away as well um, So I'm sure this has happened to many of you guys, right? But if Anna was was to run away, she would have taken her essentials. She would have taken her clothes, her wallet, her toothbrush, like at least something. But she took none of that, which led the police to believe that it was most likely a kidnapping case. First couple hours to 48 hours are the most crucial time, and the more time that it passes, the less likely that the person is found alive. Now was marking almost the two year anniversary since Anna went missing. The class that she was supposed to graduate, the middle school even held a graduation ceremony with the honor of her as she was supposed to be in that class with them. With very little hope, but the parents always, of course, believing that their child would come back home, two years later, the parents got a surprising call, which was Anna herself calling her parents saying that she was alive. Anna's mother received a call from a public telephone and it was Anna indicating that again she was alive and well and her parents asked her where was she and if she was alone. She told them that she was alone and she was at a payphone near a train station. She was instructed to call the police right away, she did, and she was found wearing light clothings and sandals and this happened in like the middle of the winter. Thankfully, it was reported that actually she was found in good health. There was no signs of visible injuries. According to some people that have witnessed this, um, she actually came back to her parents smiling, waving, seeming like she was truly okay, which is not something that you would think of when you find a kidnapped victim that comes home two years later to your home. By now, Anna was 15, 16 years old. She was like a full grown teenager. So what happened within the two years and why was she seemingly okay? Now, of course, after she went back to her parents, she told the authorities that her kidnapped captor is a man named Kabu. Terauchi. He was immediately put under the wanted list and Kabu once he came home and saw that his captive was gone He panicked freaked and left the next day very early in the morning a paper delivery man Saw this gentleman who was walking around with blood all over his body The young man told him that he got into a car crash and needed help so the man called for help and he ended up going to the hospital. He was in stable condition, he was okay, but of course they would find out that this man was Kabu Teruachi, who was wanted all over. And of course, we later found out that he was actually trying to self-harm himself and he did not get into a car crash. Kabu Terurachi, back in 2014, was a 23-year-old young man who attended a prestigious university in Japan. Not only that, but he even went to the US to get a pilot license or went to pilot school and supposedly his friends called him pilot. And here is his actual Facebook where he posted many photos of him being inside of a plane, taking lessons and things like that. I mean, if you see these photos, I mean, he seems literally like the quietest kid where people who know how to fly planes, like they're known to be free spirited. They're known to be a little bit wealthy to take all those classes, which turned out to be true. His family actually came from a well-off background. His father worked at a company that makes crime prevention items such as extra doors security stuff, you know, things to block off crime and things like that, which is ironic itself. And the business has been running for over 60 years and his parents were able to provide and support him as much as he wanted, including, you know, taking pilot lessons, going to prestigious colleges, living on his own at that age. And of course, we learn and find out that he used his father's items from his company to aid him in his crimes. According to his classmates, they describe him as pretty quiet. 
who seemed normal and nothing out of the ordinary and, and again excelled in academics. Although in high school, people remember that he specifically fell in love with this anime called The Melancholy of Harui Suzumiya. Ironically, the title in Korean of this anime is called The Depression of Harui. Some called him an otaku, as he seemed more on the quiet side, always on his computer. Um, otaku is someone who is almost obsessed with anime or some kind of a manga culture. They also love to immerse themselves in computers, games, and have more of a very close, small social cycle or life. Cases like this in Japan always sparks the debate of does the otaku or having extreme love and obsession with certain mangas and anime contribute to their crimes. And I personally believe that people who would act upon negative things will do it regardless they love or are obsessed with mangas or not. So the truth of what happened during those two years is even more creepier. So the day that Anna went missing, she was coming back home from school and she was actually in front of her house. As she was about to go in, Kabu stopped her and told Anna that he was actually a lawyer. Kabu was able to lure her in because he knew the full name and address of her. Now how he got this is a bit of mystery, but police are saying that he did extensive research and stalking before he actually acted upon it. He told her that her parents were getting a divorce all of a sudden and that they told him the lawyer to take care of her meanwhile. As you could see, Anna was such an innocent child and such a kind child in a way that backfired on her that she did believe him. She got into the car of Kabu and that's when he again changed his attitude. He started to tell her a different story, telling her that actually, um, I'm trying to save you. Your parents were actually trying to sell you and like kill you and take your organs and sell it to the black market. I even have a recording of your parents talking about it. And supposedly he showed her a recording of her parents talking about her and trying to sell her organs. Now this recording sounded a bit off which later turns out to be a voice manipulating some kind of app on the phone and she probably didn't really believe in it but all the fear and confusion when you're that young and this unknown guy like feeding you these stories, it is so easy to manipulate a child. Anna was then taken into Kabu's villa slash apartment complex where she was held in a room that could only be opened from the outside. From the beginning and for the two years, Kabu would tell Anna that nobody's looking out for you. You've been discarded by your parents. Nobody cares for you. And he would feed her these things, which was obviously a psychological manipulation tactic. And it was almost as if Kabu wanted to feel like a hero, like he was keeping her safe when obviously it was the opposite and that eventually like he was the only one that cares about her and that's why he is putting her in his room safe and that she's alive and she should be grateful for that crazy thing during the two years Kabu was actually able to study, go to school. In 2016, he even got a new job after he graduated. He was hired at a company that made firefighters equipment. Even crazier, the neighbors never say that they heard a girl scream, fight, like none of that. Apparently these apartment complexes, the walls are so thin that they should have been able to hear these things, but nothing. Like it was almost as if Anna really never fought back. His university schoolmates even say that they remember him telling his friends that he got a girlfriend. So of course, parents' nightmare, what do you think would have happened within those two years? Most of the times you hear about kidnapping cases, it goes so wrong. If they survive, they survived through torture and hell. According to Anna and Kabu, I mean, there was no physical signs that she was either sexually or physically abused at all. If you see the room that she was living in, she had toys, essentials, like food stuff that she could cook, like literally the opposite of what you would expect from a captive victim. There was even a door that led to the patio, many windows and you know, chances and opportunities for her to escape. But according to Anna, she was closely observed all the time. Kabu would actually even leave for a couple of days to his parents' home or during vacations and holidays, and he would purposely lie 
locked Anna inside of the room that only could be locked from the outside. Anna actually says that she left a couple times outside with Kabu closely watching, of course, to go shopping, to go get some food and things like that. So she did have certain chances to run away, but for some reason she did not. So again, for the duration of two years, it seems like Anna was closely watched without much physical interaction between the two, which is even creepier and wilder because it was as if he was just observing a human being held captive, almost like a pet or like a zoo. I mean, you would expect that he would do something really bad to her physically, but it seems like that's not the case. And she actually had access to internet and TV. A heater, I mean, the place seemed relatively very clean. And the crazy thing is almost two years in, uh, she says that they actually moved to different apartments. So I don't know how that move situation happened, but obviously when you're moving, you gotta take all the stuff, you, you, the door has to be open, you have to go through trucks. How did they move we don't know but seems like they never got caught or Anna even ran away during that point. There was also no evidence that she was ever tied up or chained. There was even times where Kabu would forget or didn't lock the door of Anna's room. So Anna said that she would actually go out of the house when the door was unlocked and there were a couple times when she actually tried to escape or seek help and one of the times she actually went out and tried to ask a mother who was with the child for help but apparently um, the mother was confused and refused help I believe there was another time when she went out and asked an elder for help and that person also refused for whatever reason. So she felt like nobody really wanted to find her. And I think that was one of the reasons why she also decided to stay because she started to believe that really safety was maybe inside of Kabu's apartment and nobody really cared about her. People debate if Anna was going through Stockholm Syndrome, where you start to have some kind of a trust or even affection toward your captor. Another crazy thing is that there's information out there that supposedly a delivery man visited Kabu's house to deliver stuff and he would see this young girl, but then she would be kind of freely obviously inside the apartment, smiling and waving at him, you know, indicating that maybe she felt okay here and people were kind of confused confused in that in this information of what truly was going on inside Anna's mind but again I personally believe that she was literally brainwashed to think that it was okay being in that situation as she kind of became accustomed to it but we do have to note that what Kabu was trying to do was definitely manipulate her because he did not let her use the phone or give her chance to contact anyone that she knew. So he was afraid and he knew what he was doing. But we will later found out that Kabu was actually planning this for a long time where police found in the search engine, place with not a lot of people and not such a rural or quiet area and found the specific town where Anna was living in and that's where he started to target people that he wanted to kidnap. Two days prior to her escape, Anna claims that she was surfing on the internet when she saw a video about her where her parents were desperately trying to search for her. The day of the escape, Kabu told Anna that he was going to go shopping and he left the door unlocked. Anna certainly felt this urge that there were people searching for her, that her parents were indeed searching for her and that she was wanted. And that's when she got the courage to go out and call for help. Supposedly, she gathered up 500 yen. I think that's about $5 US dollars, something like that. So she stashed that money somewhere in her room, took that money and went to the payphone to call her parents. So let's talk about Kabu's mind and what he went through and his weird, creepy be fantasies. Kabu actually admitted that he had a fantasy to kidnap someone since middle school. But what was his motive if he did not physically hurt his captive? Did he just truly and solely enjoy the feeling of just having someone captive and that's it without any other really inappropriateness or abuse? But I feel like maybe he had some kind of a social issue where he could not connect with people as, as normal people do. Because he could not connect to people and talk to people in a normal sense, he just had to have this, I guess, heroic 
or a dominant feeling over someone. And the only way he was really able to feel that social pleasure or feel like someone is like his friend or there for him was to actually kidnap and capture someone. It's like literally forcing someone to be a friend or your roommate because you just don't know how to normally get that interaction. I think there was also a possible part of him that he wanted to feel like a hero or like he wanted to be looked upon by this girl thinking that he was like her savior or something. I recently saw this video of where this Korean psychologist was evaluating this child who had this very different social behavior where he was not able to interact and connect with people like normal people do. Because he does not have the normal senses and the connection, the way this child was trying to connect and make friends was through like inappropriate behaviors or talk or trying to get some kind of shock out of someone. He couldn't read people's emotions as well when there was like a picture of a girl that was like shaking or afraid he saw that as oh it seems like she's pretty she seems happy like these there are certain people who are not able to read emotions they seek and crave attention but they don't know how to get that in a normal way Maybe, maybe something truly did happen within those two years, but Anna just did not speak up about it. But again, there were no evidences that they found that anything really inappropriate or physical abuse went on. It could have been a lot worse, you guys. It could have been a lot worse. She could have been dead, but she came home alive. It seemed like, you know, she was not physically hurt. But either way, what Kabu did was take away a child's innocence, taking away her life and her freedom from her parents for two years and even though he might not have physically hurt her what he did was very very criminal during the trial kabu admitted to his crimes and the lawyers argued that he takes full responsibilities for what he has done but he did not act in any violence or hurt the girl they were also trying to argue that kabu was mentally ill where he was suffering from schizophrenia that he couldn't fully go on trial but the court did not take his excuses and sent him to nine years in prison he was also seen making erotic behaviors in court. Not sure if he was faking it or if it was real. So during court, he started to shout out, I'm a forest fairy, I'm really an amoeba. Now, is he really going through some kind of mental illness or was he faking it? We don't know because I could not find any information that he was actually evaluated thoroughly by a professional. And during the appeal ruling, the court actually raised his sentence to 12 years. The only update about Anna that we know is that her parents say that she is very afraid to go out and does not have a normal social life anymore and that she is getting treatments. As you know, her life was taken away for two years. That's a long time for a child or teenager. I mean, for that two years, she could have been educated and instead she was being dumbed down, almost like, you know, so people observing an animal in a zoo. She missed out on so much and hopefully that she was able to get re-educated and learn and get the freedom that she and everybody deserves. I really do hope that he is getting treatments and people are trying to figure out what was going on inside a mind like Kabu so that we can prevent this in the future and see some red flags and signs. Let me know what you guys have thought about this story. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to check out Care Of and see you guys in my next video.